Is it? Well, good evening. Uh, glad to see everybody out this evening. Uh, welcome here to Guest Baptist Church. Uh, glad to see all of you who've uh, come out this way. And those of you who, who may be uh, tuning in online or watching at some later time, we welcome you also. Uh, we'd like to remind you we're having uh, regular services now, Sunday school, Sunday church, Sunday evening church, Wednesday night. Uh, uh, trying to do our best to be able to continue to keep everything safe. So uh, as soon as you feel comfortable, we'd like to welcome you back to be able to come back here and to be able to fellowship with us in person. Uh, in the meantime, I'm glad we're able to do this, to be able to get the word out to those of you who, who uh, may not be able to be here tonight. So I've um, got a passage of scripture tonight, uh, Psalms chapter 27. I've been studying over this passage of scripture for a couple of weeks. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that maybe here in a minute. Psalms chapter 27. I'm going to read the first six verses. Psalm 27, starting in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Let's have a, have a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we just thank you so much for this day. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in this place tonight, Lord God. We're just so thankful for the, the chance to be here right now, be uh, studying your word, Lord God. I just pray that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit down to teach us, Lord, tonight. If we're going to learn anything, Lord, it, it won't be anything that I say, but it'll be what you do when you deal with our hearts, when your word is spoken. Lord God, we just ask that you would do that tonight. Lord, come down and speak to us. And Lord, help us to draw closer to you and to commune and fellowship with you tonight. Lord God, I just ask that you'd help me, Lord, put words into my mouth. Lord, just help me share what it is we've studied over the last little bit, Lord. Let me convey that in a way that will be meaningful to somebody tonight. Lord God, we just praise you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So my message kind of has a strange title, and it's weird because I, I said maybe three weeks ago that I, I hardly ever even title my messages, and, and since then I've had a, a title for all of them. But the, the title of tonight's message, and this will make sense maybe in a little while, the title is, Don't Spend Another Night with the Frogs. All right? Don't Spend Another Night with the Frogs. So... This is going to tie in with what John uh, preached about last Sunday when he talked about unbroken fellowship. Remember he talked to us about walking with God and about having unbroken fellowship, unbroken communion with him and, and all of those kinds of things. And that's really what sanctification is about. That's what when we learn to walk with God, when we draw closer to God, when he becomes more real to us in our lives, then we find ourselves in a better place to be able to communicate with him, to be able to have fellowship with him and all of those things. As we grow as Christians, then, then that happens. We, we, that, that's the goal is to get us to this point of unbroken fellowship, this point of communion with him. Now, I went on vacation and I wasn't here. Or I was here last Wednesday, but I wasn't in the pulpit last Wednesday. And uh, we had gone on vacation, and when I go on vacation, usually there's something that I have that I'm intentionally studying when I go on vacation. There's something that I set about to do. And I, I began to pour over this psalm, Psalm 27. And I began to read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. No telling how many times I read that psalm, or this psalm that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. But I kept reading that psalm over and over. And I took a book with me, and the name of the book was called The Sacrament of the Present Moment. 
And it's by a, a monk in the 1700s. His name was John Pierre de Cassade. Don't ask me how to spell it. But anyway, he, was, uh, um, he wrote this book. It's a series of letters to the nuns that he was in charge of or ministering to. And it's called The Sacrament of the Present Moment. Now to the Catholics, and, and, and of course he was a Catholic monk or a, or a priest or whatever, but to the Catholics, a sacrament is something that imparts grace. When they talk about a sacrament, in the, the Baptist church we have two ordinances, the, and that's baptism and the Lord's Supper. They call it a sacrament, and they say that it imparts grace to you, is what it is they say. And, and baptism, the Lord's Supper, marriage, those are three of the things. They actually have seven sacraments, but I won't bore you with all of that. But I mentioned marriage specifically because I don't know if you noticed today, the Pope come out on the news today and has actually supported same-sex marriage. Now, he said that, they would, that the church was going to recognize same-sex unions and all of that. Now, I don't know that that means that the Catholics are going to begin marrying same-sex people, but they recognize the fact. Now, now get this, okay? The leader of one-sixth of the world's population there's one point, I looked it up today, there's 1.3 billion Catholics in the world. One-sixth of the world's population. He's the one they look to for advice, and he has said that same-sex unions are okay. That we are going to recognize those in a legal way as them being family is the way that he put it. So it won't be long before they are marrying them, I believe, and all of those kinds of things. But anyway, this, these, these sacraments uh, that the... That the Catholic Church has, this Jesuit priest from the 1700s, he said this, he says, this present moment, right now, this present moment is a means of God imparting grace to you. What he says is that right now, God is trying to speak to you. God is trying to have a relationship with you. He's trying to have fellowship with you. He's trying to have communion with you right now. Right now, God wants you to be able to focus your time and your attention and all that you are on Him and Him alone and to be able to set Him aside and esteem Him in a way that you put Him as the most important thing as far as you're spending your time. Right now, God wants to speak to you. We look and we have the example in Scripture about creation. And when we look at creation, we understand that creation is ever-changing, right? It's never the same. From second to second, it changes and it moves. And we don't like that word evolve, but that's really what it does as things grow and plants come up and trees and the leaves change. And while on one side of the world the sun's coming up, it's going down here on the other side. And, and all of these kinds of things, the complexity of the ecosystem is just miraculous, right? If people ask you, have you ever seen a miracle, you should be able to say yes. Yes, I have seen a miracle. And here in the next second, you're fixing to see another one, all right? You just saw a miracle. Here in the next second, you're fixing to see another and another and another because it's constantly changing. The sunset is never the same twice. The sunrise is never the same twice. God paints a beautiful picture in the sky that is constantly moving and shaping about. It's the, the world is just miraculous in everything that we see and everything that there is. There will never be another second like the one you just had. It just slipped away. There's more coming, hopefully. But all we have is right now. And it is in this current moment where we are able to meet God. We can only meet God in the present, right? We can't go back and meet Him yesterday. I wish I could go, right, go back and get right with God in the past, right? Sooner. Go, go back sooner when I was a younger man and make some better decisions and all of that. I wish I could do that. I can't do that. You can't meet Him yesterday. You can't set up an appointment for tomorrow, right? You, well, tomorrow at 1140, I'm going to make an appointment with God. It doesn't work that way. It is only right now in this present moment that God is able to meet you and that God is able to speak to you by His Spirit, right? He can't speak to you yesterday. It's only right now that God is able to speak to you. It's only right now that you're able to be obedient to His will. See, you can't say, well, I, I plan to be obedient tomorrow, right? That's, see, that's not the way this works. When God speaks and tells us to do something, we have to be obedient now. We have to listen now because it is now that God speaks to us. 
But see, we have an adversary who wants us to live outside of the present moment. That's what the devil does, is tries to get us to live outside of this moment. And we've talked about his tactics and all of those tactics of doubt, division, discouragement, distraction. I, I like all them D words I use whenever I, I talk about this. But whatever he can do to be able to draw you away from God and to keep you from God in this present moment is what the devil wants to do. David tells us that we're supposed to have confidence in God. We're supposed to trust Him. We are supposed to have faith in Him. And we struggle with this sometimes because we don't turn it all over to Him, right? We say we're people of faith, but we don't actually surrender everything to Him. We worry, we fret, and we stress, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and it, it really shows that we are immature in our faith whenever we, we, we do that. So we're supposed to trust God right now. And in every moment of our lives, we are to trust Him. David says, the Lord is my light. He said, the Lord is my light. Now notice this. He doesn't say, the Lord was my light yesterday. He doesn't say, the Lord is going to be my light tomorrow, even though both of those things may be true. But he says, the Lord is my light. In this moment right now, God is illuminating my heart and my mind. God is dealing with me. He is speaking with me. In this moment, God is doing what light does, and he is revealing himself to David. And he wants to do the same for us. In this moment right now, God wants to reveal himself to us. He has opened our hearts. He has opened our minds. We are new creations. We have been born of the Spirit. We are, we are, we are born again and all of that. And, and by the Holy Spirit, He wants to be able to show you the path to walk. But see, we have to be connected in the present moment and allow the Spirit to speak. If we're not connected in the present moment, then we don't know what God wants us to do because we're somewhere else other than right there where God is able to commune with us. Okay? You see where we're going? He wants you to walk with Him right now. Not be sorrowful for the fact that you didn't yesterday. Amen. He don't want you to worry about tomorrow. He wants you to walk with him right now. To be useful, we have to learn how to walk with him. Amen. If we're going to be useful for him, we have to be able to walk with him. David says, the Lord is my salvation. He's my deliverance. See, we like to think of that event. We got saved a long time ago, right? The Lord has delivered you from the punishment of sin when you got saved. We, we, we've all heard that, right? He's going to deliver you from the presence of sin in the future. But right now, we, don't under, we forget that God is willing to deliver us from the power of sin. Right now, if we can turn to Him and have communion and fellowship with Him, God will deliver us from the power of sin. He is my deliverance. See, I can turn to Him in times of trouble. That's what David says in the psalm. I can turn to him now. When I have trouble right now, I can turn to him, and he is someone who will come alongside me, and he will help me. But see, we turn everywhere, but rather than turn to God, right? I mean, he's our last resort. Generally, we'll try and we'll, we'll find our friends, and we'll turn on Dr. Phil, and we'll do anything we can to be able to try and find an answer. And then finally, we'll end up when we're desperate, we'll find ourselves in front of God, right? But he should be the first one we turn to. See, David understood that when all hell comes against me, there is a place that I can go. There is a person that I can turn to. There is a door. There is a shelter. There is a safe place of protection under his wings where God is willing to come alongside and commune with us and keep us safe and protect us from sin. He can be your deliverance right now. Not just that one day we'll be carried out of this world and we won't have to worry about it anymore, but he is able to give us that deliverance today. Today he is able to deliver us. David says the Lord is the strength of my life. He is the strength of my life. Can we say that? Can we say that he is our strength, that he is our power, and he is our peace? But see, he will only be those things to the degree that you choose to walk with him. Amen. See, that's, that's where we come up short. That's where we have the problem, is that we don't choose to walk with him all the time, and therefore we walk around powerless, and we don't have any strength, and we don't have any power, and we don't have any peace, because we're not willing to surrender ourselves and let him be Lord of our lives. See, he wants to deliver you right now so that he can illuminate you and give you power and strength to go and do his purposes. And all he needs is a willing vessel. If you'll just be submissive, and if you will just be a willing vessel, God will meet you right now in this place, in this hour, at this time, and he will show you what he wants you to do and he will point you down the right path. And it's just up to you to walk it whenever he does that. Amen. We are able to meet him and him show us what it is 
that he wants us to do. Verse 2 of Psalm 27, notice the word came. We've been talking about the present. The Lord is, right? Verse 2, David used the word came. See, in the past, David faced some wicked enemies, he said. He faced some wicked foes. They tried to kill him. They tried to consume his flesh. The word means literally eat him is what the word means. They tried to devour him, consume him. They come after him with their gnashing with their teeth to try and tear him to pieces. That's what the enemy did to him, but they stumbled and fell. See, their plans were not successful. See, I don't know when this all was written, but David had a lot of trouble in his life. There was a lot of trouble that he went through, but God had been faithful to him in the past, and that's why he writes these things. Have you faced trouble in the past? Has God been faithful to you in the past when you faced that trouble? Well, why don't we choose to remember that? Amen. See, what we choose to remember is the trouble, right? Amen. Oh, you know, this happened, blah, 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 and we remember all the trouble. We don't remember how it could have been worse and what God delivered us from and what we actually deserved, right? We, 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 we focus on what we got rather than what we deserved and, and how God's been good and gracious and merciful to us. We focus on all the trouble. But see, David chose not to live in the past. He could have said, oh, yeah, the Lord used to be my salvation. He delivered me a long time ago, but boy, I'm in a mess now, right? He didn't say that. He said, the Lord is my salvation. He has power right now to help me, Amen. right? It's not about the past, right? God has been faithful, but if we live in the past, see, David could have lived in the past, but it would have crippled him, and he'd have been useless for God. Here's Satan's trap. Here's what Satan does to you. He tries to get you to live in the past. Remember what they did to you? He'll speak that into your, into your heart. You remember how they made you feel? You remember what they said about you? You going to take that? He'll attack your pride. Amen. He'll get at you real quick. Don't forget those things. Don't forgive them. You just hold on to that. You just... You just remember what they did to you. You just dwell on them problems of the past. That's what the devil wants you to do. But if you get hung up in the past, you lose your life. You will lose your life. You choose to live outside the present moment. You can let your past defeat you and cripple you and make you useless. Or you can put it in the past and you can embrace God now. And you can go and do what it is he wants you to do. See, there's people that's stuck in the past. There's things they just can't get over. They can't move on. They're stuck. That, that, um, they don't know where to go. If you came from an abusive place in the way that I did, then you don't trust people. You have all this, you're, you're skeptical and, and, and you worry about all this stuff going on. But let me tell you, you can't live there. Amen. You can't live there anymore because you'll lose your life. You can't live in the past. Look at verse 3, Psalm 27. This verse is about the future. David says, if an army camps against me, if war rises up against me, he says, my heart will not fear. No matter what happens or what the future holds, if the Lord is my strength, I don't have to be afraid of any foe, do I? Amen. If the Lord is my strength, who do I have to fear? Who do I have to be afraid of? 2 Kings chapter 6, Syria is coming against the nation of Israel. It says there's a great host and it appears the battle is going to be hopeless, right? And, and Elisha, Elisha's servant, it says, feared. And, and Elisha says this, he says, They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And it says Elisha prays and his servant's eyes are open to see the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire all around them, right? The heavenly army has surrounded them to be able to fight for them and to be able to help them in all of that. See, if we could only just see what's really going on. See, it's a spiritual battle. And we can't see all of it, but if we could see it. See, in Christ, we don't have anything to be afraid of. But yet, we're crippled by fear sometimes. But in Christ, we have nothing to be afraid of. David says this. He says, In this I will be confident. The Lord is my light. He is my salvation. He is the strength of my life. He was faithful yesterday. He's going to be faithful tomorrow. And I know that He's faithful right now. If I will just turn to Him in my time of trouble, He will show up and He will help me and He will deliver me out of this situation. He will help me to be able to get through it if He don't deliver me through it. But God will be there if I will just... Turn to him. Don't forget that he is faithful right now because for us, that's where the battle is, right? Amen. The battle is right now. Yeah. I mean, it's real. The battle is right now. We may face a battle tomorrow. 
We may have been in a serious one yesterday, but right now it's where the battle is. It's, it's right up here in our, in our minds, right? Some of the folks in our church are in a battle. I mean, they're, they're, they're fighting. I mean, just fighting tooth and nail trying to hold their ground against the devil. Some of them's in a battle, I'm telling you. But when the battle gets hot, I heard this one time, when the battle gets hot, if you're alone, you're losing. Now what they did there, that's what David did to Uriah the Hittite. He said, y'all get up in the heat of the battle and y'all withdraw and just leave him alone. And he died, right? If you're, if you're alone in the battle, you're losing. You need God to stand there with you. And see, that's where we fail. We want to go at it alone rather than choose to embrace him and let him come along and be our light and our salvation and our deliverance. See, some of the people are hung up on what if. You know what I'm talking about? What if this happens? What if so-and-so gets elected and the stock market crashes and we're all broke, right? I mean, that's what we say, right? That, that's what's going to happen, right? We're we all going to be broke. Won't nobody ever be able to retire if so-and-so gets elected, right? What if the aliens come and steal my garbage can? Where am I going to put my garbage can, right? I mean, I, I mean, we come up with some radical scenarios, don't we? I mean, we worry about stuff that could never happen, right? Don't we? I, I mean, I'm not the only one that has thoughts like that, right? What if? There's a whole bunch of people that's just hung up on what if, and that will cripple you too. It will make you useless for God if you get hung up on all of this what if stuff. You need to just trust Christ, right? Just trust Him. See, anxiety and fear comes from living outside the moment. If you're worried about the future and things that are never going to happen, you can't embrace God right now Amen. because you're worried about that. that. Because right here is where we meet God, right? Living in the past or living in the future, you lose the present moment. And why does that matter? Because this moment is all you got. We're not promised nothing about the future. The past is irretrievably gone. All we got is right now. And God created us to live in the moment. And you say, why do I say that? How can I say that, that God created us to live in the moment? He gave you five senses to be able to encounter the world and to be able to embrace Him and, and everything that He's created. Five senses we are able to see and hear and smell and taste and touch. John, go see tomorrow for me and tell me what's going to happen tomorrow at 2 o'clock. You can't see tomorrow, right? You can only see right now. I want to go back and hear what was said yesterday down the street. My neighbor was talking about me. I want to go back and hear that. You, you can't go back and hear it, right? That was yesterday. You can only hear now. See, that's our problem. We're trying to listen and worried about what was said yesterday rather than listening to what God will say to us right now. Amen. Right now, he's wanting to speak to you, but you're worried about that thing you heard yesterday. See, you, you, we're outside the present moment. We lose our lives. We lose our ability to commune with God. Y'all see where I'm at in all of this? If Satan can convince you to live in the past or the future, he has unplugged you from the power source. If he can get you anywhere than in the present moment, you've been unplugged from the power source. You have no power. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Today. Don't worry about tomorrow yet. Just today follow me. Tomorrow he'll say the same thing. Take up your cross daily and follow me. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Let yesterday go. Learn from it. Move on. His mercies are new every morning. Have you ever had just a perfect moment in time? Just a perfect moment in time. First time you held your child, you know. I've heard guys talk about being in the, in, in the tree stand and they'll talk about how the, the frost was on the ground and they could see their breath and they could hear the squirrels trampling through the, the leaves and it was just always right with the world, right, you know. Or maybe you're out there watching your kids play in the pool and you got a sweet tea in your hand and they're giggling and laughing. You got no cares, no worries, everything. All's just right with the world. You, you just got a perfect little moment in time, right? And wish you could remember it forever. Let me tell you what happened to me in Belize. We went to the, the, the Mayan ruins. Uh, uh, Lubentun, I believe is how you say it. And uh, we were kind of doing a video to be able to do some... Uh, fundraising, different things, snapping videos, spent a couple hours out there at the mine ruins one day towards the end of the week. 
way out on the back of the property. I don't even know if y'all will remember this or not. It may not have even struck you as being that, that miraculous, but there was a tree over there that had yellow blooms all in it. That tree had yellow blooms all in it, and those blooms had fallen around the tree in just a perfect concentric circle out there. And there was, nobody had walked through it and disturbed it or nothing. I mean, every little petal had just fallen right there where, where God wanted them to fall, I guess you could say. And to me, it was just magical when I walked up on that and saw that sitting there, just to be in that moment, in that place where I was in my spirit, everything just kind of come together. And I thought, God has chosen this moment to be able to show me something miraculous about his glory and his creation. Amen. Just, just, in that, just in that moment, all of that. And you might say, well, it's just blooms, right? It's just, it's just little yellow blooms laying on the ground. Oh, but if you've got eyes to see, let me tell you, it's so much more. It's so much more if you've got eyes to see. If, if, if you're worried about the world, you walk right past and you don't pay no attention. But when you're communing with God and you've got eyes to see, oh, it's, it's, it's so much more that you're able to see. And I thought about this poem by a guy named William Blake. It says, To see a world in a grain of sand, in a heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. You realize that God wants to show you a world in a grain of sand? The building blocks of nature and all of this stuff are molecular. They're so tiny and small that in, that in something the, the size of this, the number of molecules are just astronomical in number. And God has organized all of those things and all of creation. You're able to see a world in a grain of sand if you have eyes to see, right? What about um, uh, the, uh, a heaven in a wildflower. I brought some flowers tonight. You know, we walk right by and, and we, we go right by all of these beautiful flowers that are around. We don't have time to smell the roses, right? That's even a saying we've got. Oh, there's no time to smell the roses. We just keep on going along, right? But scripture says that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these. In all of his glory, he was not arrayed as a lily of the field, it says over there. We need eyes to be able to see. See, that's the sacrament of the present moment. When you can get there and commune with God in the present moment, in that way, in that place, God is finally able to speak to you. If you hung up in the past or if you hung up in the future, God can't commune with you that way. You can't get there. In this present moment, God wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to speak to you. And all of creation cries out constantly, Oh, what a glorious God we have. What a glorious God we have. What a glorious Savior we have. Creation is just crying out. But you know what I did in Belize? I grabbed my phone. And I start taking pictures, right? I start taking pictures. I want to preserve this moment. I want to remember this moment. I want to remember the way that God spoke to me. But you know what actually happened? I lost the present moment. When I grabbed this and started searching for my camera, all of a sudden I'm not communing with God anymore. I'm not in the present moment. I stepped outside the present moment. I broke the chain of communion and he's no longer speaking to me and I made an idol out of my experience. See, my intention was good. I wanted to remember that, right? I wanted to remember the way I felt and see that and all of that. I was going to have a picture tonight and have us put a picture up here of those yellow flowers on the ground, but, but my picture doesn't do justice to the way that I felt in that present moment, see? See, that's what we do. We do this all the time. We go to the kids' ball game and we're texting somebody and we're not watching the ball game and we're texting somebody that's at a different property and you're not present at the ball game and you're not present with the person you're talking to either. You're not present in either place. You're just somewhere lost in time out there. You're, you're not in 
the present moment. We go to a concert and, and I remember going to Winter Jam and trying to record stuff to video it and watch it later and I end up deleting the videos because, you know, I just, rather than enjoy it while I'm there and enjoy the, the situation, then I try and video it to save it for later and it's not as good later and, and I end up not enjoying neither one, right? But see, the problem is our lives are in such a mess that we do this at church. This is where the church is. We do this at church. You're here, but you're not here. You're absent from your own life. Amen. Blessed is your right side. And we're yawning. And watching our phones and our watches, right? I'm, seriously. Amen. That's, where the, Amen. That, that's where most of the church is. And y'all don't see it the way we see it from right here, I'm telling you. There's a glazed overlook that comes on some people's eyes when they come in the doors of this church. And I don't know why it is. But it's just like, oh, Lord, i got to sit here for another hour and a half. I'm miserable, right? That's what it looks like sometimes. You're here, but you're not here. I'm just being honest with you, David. I'm just telling you, that's what a lot of people look like. But confidence and faith and trust in God means that I'm going to live with Him in the present and I'm going to have communion with Him. Unbroken fellowship is what you talked about. I'm going to learn to walk with Him. Look at verse 4. David says, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Wednesday, right? Not when the pastor's looking, but all the days of my life, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to be in His presence. If you could walk hand in hand with Jesus, would you? You can. That's what his word tells us. You can. You just have to let go of all that mess and not worry about that other stuff and focus on him right here and now in the present. You can walk with him hand in hand, I'm telling you. If every moment is a gift of God or a gift from God, then in each of these moments we can find a way to acknowledge him, a way to praise him, or a way to be thankful. And our problem is we just don't want to. We just don't want to do that because we'd rather be mad, right? Seriously, we'd rather be mad. We'd, we'd rather be guilt-ridden over all the things that we've done in the past. We'd rather worry about all of that. We'd, we'd rather be rebellious. See, you can't walk with God and be an intentional sin. Amen. See, if you step out in intentional sin, you let go of His hand. Right. Now, I'm not saying that you've, you've lost your salvation or nothing, but I'm saying fellowship's broken. Because he ain't going to walk in the sin with you. So when you see some sin and you decide to go after it, you just let go of his hand. He didn't let go of yours. You let go of his. Amen. And you step out here into sin, right? It's another monk from the, I believe is the 1600s. His name's Brother Lawrence. Y'all have heard me talk about him before. The practice of the presence of God. He said that after God saved his poor, wretched, miserable soul, he decided that he was going to spend the less rest of his life trying to do all he could to be able to think about him and bring him to mind and just constantly focus on God. And he was a cook and a bottle washer and a sandal repairman in the convent or the, or the place he was in as a monk there. And, and that's what he did. He repaired sandals and did dishes and all of that. And he'd get in there scrubbing pots and pans and just praise God and think about God and commune with God while he was doing the most meaningless chores, Right? And he says that after years that his times of prayer became no different than the rest of his day. See, the monks were required to pray like four or six hours a day. They'd get up at three o'clock in the morning and go pray for two hours, you know. And, and he said his whole day was just an act of prayer because he was communing with God all day long. The practice of the presence of God. Do you want to be that close? You better because that's what heaven's going to be. That's what heaven's going to be. You say, oh, I can't give you my time when I sleep. Well, let me tell you this. When you get your heart right and you get free from fear and you get free of worry, you'll even have peaceful dreams and peaceful sleep. Amen. You can even give him your, your heart whenever you, you, you go to sleep. If you go to sleep in the right way, and not worried and consumed with fear and all of these things. David says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. Oh, I want to see it. I've got, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And you say, well, we can't see the beauty of the Lord. Yeah, you can see the beauty of the Lord. Look around. Look at creation. 
You know when your pastor stands up here full of the Holy Spirit and, and preaches to you? Scripture says, Behold, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach glad tidings of good things. Beautiful to be able to see whenever your pastor stands up here and preaches full of the Holy Spirit. Your Sunday school teacher comes and, and, and teaches you or you love your neighbor or you pass out gift bags or we make shoe boxes to be able to, to give to people or you, you go visit those that are sick and in prison or you make a wheelchair ramp. See, you see the beauty of the Lord being acted out in His body, the church. You can see the beauty of the Lord. David says, I want to inquire in His temple. And that's not the same. David says, I want to go to church. It's not the same as, as dwelling in his house. Dwelling in his house means I want to be with God, right? But what, what he says here is I want to go to the temple and I want to offer the appropriate sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 tells us about the appropriate sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A living sacrifice. That's what God wants. And that's what we're supposed to be. But see, the part we don't like is the sacrifice has to die. We've got to die to ourselves. We've got to die to ourselves, And part of that is not just that I, that I don't sin right now in this moment, but that I let the past go. And all of the guilt and the shame and everything else has been taken away. And I don't worry about the future and all of that stress, but I focus right now on God. I give Him myself right now, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God right now to do with as He pleases. We can seek Him. We can have confidence in Him. We can know Him. And if you have this unbroken fellowship with him, here's what's going to happen when trouble comes. Verse 5, in the time of trouble, God will hide me. In the time of trouble, God will hide me. Trouble will be looking for you and won't be able to find you because you're going to be wrapped up in God. Trouble will not be able to find you. You'll be hidden, David says in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. God will put you in the holy place. That's what that says right there, in the secret of his tabernacle. He'll set you in the holy place, and when the devil tries to come after you, he won't be able to touch you because you'll be hidden with God. He will set you upon a rock, set you upon a rock, a sure foundation that can't be moved, David says. Oh, he's going to set you up upon a rock. You won't be able to be moved. Be solid on that foundation. God will lift up your head. You won't be downcast. And you'll bring a sacrifice of joy, he said. Bring a sacrifice of joy. Sing praises to him. So you can only sing in the present, right? The present moment is the only time we can offer a sacrifice of joy or a sacrifice of praise. But see, it's in the time of trouble when we fall apart. It's in the time of trouble when trouble comes against us and rises up against us that we have our greatest, uh, our greatest uh, times of, of failure, I guess I could say. Here's why we can't worship. This is why we can't hear God's voice. It's why we can't focus on the Bible. It's why we can't pray right. It's because we're living outside the moment. In order to pray, you got to get in the moment. Can't be consumed with worry and fear. You got to get in the moment and commune with God to be able to pray, to study His Word. When I read the Bible, it just don't speak to me. Get your heart at peace and let all that mess go and sit down with His Word, and God will commune with you and He will speak to you. We carry around all that baggage and stuff. We just need to give it to Him. When we live in the past or in the future, it affects our prayer, it affects our study, it affects our worship. And we miss God is what happens. Because we're too bound up in all the other mess. And moments slip by. Moments that we could have spent with Him. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. 
Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. God is our refuge. He is our strength. A safe place. A very present help in trouble. A very present help in a time of trouble. He's all around us. He's all around us just crying out, wanting to be able to commune with us and be with us and speak to us and all that. Verse 10 of chapter 46 there in the Psalms is a verse we all know. It says, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. When's the last time you were still? See, some of us don't get still because we don't like the things that go through our head when we get still because we remember all that mess of the past, right? We don't get still because we're afraid of the things that are going to come back to haunt us and, and, and all of that, right? We've got to let the past go. It's gone. Quit trying to revive it and bring it back. It's gone. All the anxiety of the future, we've got to let it go and we've got to learn how to meet God here and now. We've got to meet Him right here and now because this is all we got. This heartbeat, this breath, this moment. We're not, we're not guaranteed nothing beyond this right here. Right now. John Ortberg says one of the most dangerous words in the English language is found in Exodus chapter 8. I love John Ortberg. I read, and I'm not going to read any scripture from there. You'll know the story when we get there. John Ortberg, I read all of his books when they come out and all this kind of stuff. He says the most dangerous word in the English language you can find in Exodus chapter, or one of the most dangerous, he says, you can find in Exodus chapter 8. See, God sending plagues upon the nation of Egypt. Remember, the second plague is frogs. They send out all the frogs, right? And all, here come all these, all these frogs. Remember that all the plagues in, in Exodus are attacks on the gods of Egypt so that each one has a reference back to an Egyptian god. See, they worship the frog god. And the, the frog god's name was H-E-K-E-T, and it was a body of a human, and it had the head of a frog. And that's what the Egyptians uh, uh, worshipped. God tells Aaron and Moses, stretch forth your rod and, and all these frogs are going to come forth, right? Scripture says frogs are everywhere. They're in the palace. They're in the bedchamber. They're, they're all over the place. I mean, there's just frogs coming up everywhere. They couldn't move without stepping on a frog. And, and the picture I get and from Scripture is that the frogs were like jumping on them. And I, I mean, the frogs are literally everywhere. And Pharaoh's not going to be outdone. He has his magicians call forth more frogs, right? Because he don't want to be outdone. He has his magicians summon frogs and here come more frogs are coming, right? It's, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's comical really whenever you begin to, to think about this. But finally after having enough, Moses is summoned and he comes before Pharaoh. And Moses says, the frogs can be gone. All you got to do is say when. All, all this croaking, slimy mess, it can all stop right now if you'll just say, let the you know, let the frogs go, right? If, all you got to do is say the word. And we'd say, yes, get rid of these frogs, right? We don't, we don't want these frogs everywhere. Get rid of them right now. But Pharaoh says, how about tomorrow? See, there's the word. That's one of the most dangerous words in the English language. We're not in the present moment. You say, oh, that can wait till tomorrow, right? I don't, wanna, I'm, I don't really want to deal with that now. Rather than surrender to God, I think I'll just take another night with the frogs. That's what Pharaoh said. He said, no, your God ain't going to have his way this time. You, you can do that tomorrow, but right now I think, I'll just, I think I'll just take another night with the frogs. See, some of us have been waiting on tomorrow. And we've been waiting a long time. Keep waiting on tomorrow, waiting on tomorrow, waiting on tomorrow. Been waiting a long time, and the whole time God's crying out. Get right today. You can be saved today. Today's the day of salvation. You can repent today. We can have communion today. We can fellowship today. All of these things. But, but we keep saying, ah, you know, I, I think I'll just take another night with frogs. He can remove all your fear, all your worries. He can give you peace. Eh, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, right? Church, when do we plan to repent? 
When you will see God move? Tomorrow? When you want to be in His presence? When you want to praise Him? When you want to get right with that person that you're at odds with? When do you want to see His glory? Can we do it right now? Tomorrow may never come. Amen. May never be a tomorrow. But the devil says, yeah, tomorrow's good. You just keep waiting. You've waited 20 years to get right with your brother. What's another day going to matter? Amen. Right? What does it matter? And then tomorrow never comes. Whatever's keeping you out of the present moment with God is too costly. Amen. Whatever it is in your life that's keeping you from communing with God in this present moment right now is not worth the price you're paying. It's not worth it. Don't spend another night with the frogs. There's a the title of my message. Don't spend another night with the frogs. You can walk with God now. You can have communion and fellowship with Him in this moment right here, right now. All it takes is a willing vessel to be submissive and surrender. That's all it takes. Bless y'all. This is um, something that uh, I've been dealing with for years, honestly. Uh, this whole idea, I've never really had a message that exactly come together the way this one did to deal with this topic as a whole. I've mentioned it at different times, but never really fully had a, a whole message about this idea of what it really means for us to walk with God. We've got this, this, this thing in our mind that, that we think if, if we just show up on Sunday and come back to church on Wednesday that everything's good and we're walking with God. But, but oh, He wants so much more. Amen. He wants so much more. He's willing to show us so much in His Word and so much of, of His world and in His goodness and His beauty if we just have eyes to see. If we'll just slow down enough to look and to be able to see God has so much He wants to show us. So bless y'all and I hope y'all at home have a good evening.